PhD in statistical physics at the interface with computer science and information theory at the International School for Advanced Study in Trieste in 2005. From 2006 and 2008, he was a postdoc at the Lab for Neurophysics and Physiology at the University Paris Descartes in France. From 2009-2013, he was a staff scientist and then a bursting fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization in Göttingen, in Germany. Since 2013 to 2016, he has been associate scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Dynamic and Self-Organization in the Nonlinear Dynamics Department, also in Göttingen. From 2013 to 2015, he was also, he had a Marie Curie or Marie Slotkova Curie Fellowship at the Institute for Neuroscience in, in the University Ace Marcel, Marcel in France. And since 2015, he's permanent researcher, scientist, CNRS in Cognitive Neuroscience Section at the University for System Neuroscience in, in Marcel. Oh, Demians carried out an interdisciplinary research at the crossroad between physics of complexity, computation and information science, and neuroscience. He's expert in the theoretical and computational analysis of the dynamics of multi-scale brain circuit with emphasis on its role in flexible information routing. In the last year, he has broadened his research to encompass the investigation of the whole brain scale network, combining sophisticated modeling and data analysis. So Demian, thank you very much for being here and you can start whenever you want. And thanks for this ultra introduction. So actually, I feel embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, don't worry. Okay, can you hear me properly? Yes. Okay, then now I go. Thanks for inviting me to, to Palma. Well, I would have preferred being uh, under the sun and uh, on the side of the beach or eating some kind of nice Spanish food, but that's how life it is, and I can still give my talk. Okay, so let me share the screen. I should be uh, here. Okay, then now I am going to. Okay, can you see the slide and can you see my pointer? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Great. So everything is working. Okay. So thanks for uh, yes, uh, thanks for for inviting me once again and. Uh, well, I realized yesterday giving the introductory lecture to the students that uh, when uh, I give a seminar over Zoom, it takes longer than when I do it from real. So I may need on the, on, to make some kind of cut online to my slides. I apologize in advance for this, but let's see uh, how it goes. How long I'm supposed to be speaking? 50 minutes, approximately? Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay. So um, this talk is going to be to review some uh, older work uh, that I initiated when I was still in Göttingen at the Bernstein Center in Computational Neuroscience with uh, Fred Wolf, Theo Geisel, and co-workers. And then in the second part, I will try presenting some uh, newer research that I have initiated in Marseille in collaboration with experimentalists there, and notably the group of Christophe Bernard and Pascal Quilichini. So the second part is also going to be a bit more speculative, but it's probably the most interesting because uh, it's still uh, hot material. In sense. The first part is now established. It's a bit of a closed chapter in the, in the book of my research. Not that I'm not interested in it anymore, but closed in the sense that it has taken a shape. While the second part is still pretty fluid. So I hope that the lack of clarity is going to be compensated by the fact that it is thought-provoking and uh, maybe changing a bit the way in which I, I am considering the role of oscillation. So the, the title announce the, the arc that my research about oscillations and their role of, in information processing have been following over the last uh, seven, 10 years now. Okay, so uh, let's jump start. And uh, let me give you a reminder about uh, the notion of communication through coherence. I'm sure that most of you are really familiar with it, but I will uh, represent it briefly. So uh, oscillations have been uh, uh, 
has been hypothesized to play a very important role in neural information processing. Uh, once upon a time, we had uh, Volsinger and uh, his own idea of oscillations as representational mechanism, uh, synchrony as meaning binding of higher order per set. So um, other schools of thought, notably the, uh, the Lisman one and the Buzaki one, in a sense, uh, think that oscillations are like something like providing a temporal scaffold for constructing complex temporal codes. But more recently, and probably even more convincingly, in my opinion, so another role for oscillations has been uh, proposed and uh, also substantiated by a, a large amount of experimental evidence. And uh, uh, this role is not the role of, uh, is not a representational role, but is more of a service role. The role of, uh, so oscillation will not play directly a role in representing information and in creating the codes, but they would uh, act as the traffic agents uh, allowing to send the right code words where they are needed or to pull the right code words from where they are needed. Basically, oscillations as devices not really for information representation, but for information routing of arbitrarily complex representation that are not necessarily specified. So uh, how oscillations could play this role in routing? Well, uh, once again, the original idea was uh, Bob Singer one in reality, and, uh, and uh, Charles Gray one. Uh, uh, Charles, Gray, Charles Gray and Paul Singer, uh, Maxim Volgush, have realized actually that uh, the, the fact that the population, the neuronal population, has an ongoing oscillatory activity modulates periodically the excitability of the neurons inside this population, making them uh, basically raising or lowering their threshold uh, rhythmically in phase with the ongoing population oscillation. So if, this, if excitation is modulated, so uh, an input spike received by a neuron will be transduced into an output spike with the probability, which actually depends on the phase of the oscillation at which this input spike is received. So uh, Pascal Fries elaborated on this finding uh, and uh, proposed what is now known as the communication through difference framework, according to which, if you want to have two neuronal population uh, communicating efficiently, it's not enough just to connect them anatomically, to have them structurally connected, but you also need to make them functionally connected by suitably aligning the phase of their respective oscillation. So in this cartoon I'm drawing here, I have a group of sender neurons encoding for the presence of an apple. Here I have another group of sender neurons encoding for the presence of a pear, and uh, I am attending to the apple. Therefore, I would like the higher order, the third higher order population to encode just for the attended percept and not for the unattended one. So in this specific configuration, you see that there is a good phase relation between the apple sender and the receiver. Therefore, when the spike sent by the apple center, center, sender will reach the receiver population, there will be a large probability for this spike being transduced into an output spike. Therefore, the message will pass. On the contrary, the message from the pair neurons will reach the neurons in the, the target population at the bad phase where excitability is depressed. And therefore, even if the message, the spiky message is traveling along a structural connection, a structural fiber, which has maybe precisely the same strength as the one linking the apple sender with the receiver, the information will nevertheless be not transduced. So uh, according to communication to coherence, phase relations and changing phase relations are a way to gate functional connectivity dynamically on top of a frozen structural connectivity. Okay, that's a nice story. That's a very exciting mechanism. There are several experimental hints that it may be true, but it's not so simple. As a matter of fact, the scientific community is split between oscillopartisans and oscilloskeptics. Uh, what I propose to you is the oscillopartisan point of view, of course. But oscilloskeptics has also a variety of very good arguments. Uh, and we shouldn't ignore them. Especially, we shouldn't ignore them if we are oscillopartisans, as in a sense I am. 
because these arguments uh, are such to criticize and to put in danger the entire conceptual basis of the functional theories about the role of oscillations. Okay, so uh, what are these arguments? Well, one argument is that correlations are really weak in reality between neurons, uh, uh, and uh, uh, these actually, and therefore the synchronization level in the brain will not be as large as uh, the oscillopartisan peak. So, for instance, here I'm copying a power spectrum from uh, an early work by the group of Bob Shapley at NYU, showing that there is nothing like a gamma peak. So, uh, all, what, what I presented, you suppose that there is something like a strong gamma oscillation or a strong beta oscillation acting uh, a, 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 as the gator, as the carrier of the information traveling. But when you look at the spectra, in reality, the spectra are, are pretty broadband. There is absolutely nothing like the sharp peak that you would have if you really had an oscillatory career. Uh, another argument is uh, the lack of metronomes. Okay, so when Bob Shapley, a group further going on uh, on these early critics, uh, uh, analyzed really the statistics of gamma bursting in vivo in the region, in the brain region themselves, where gamma oscillations and their role in synchrony and, uh, and routing had been first studied, notably visual cortex. And what they found looking at these studies is that uh, uh, when you look at how gamma activity looks in vivo in these regions, in reality, it is not at all persistent. It is not at all a metronome, but it is short-lived, you see, and fluctuating in frequencies and occurring at stochastic durations. So, uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at the distribution of uh, these gamma bursts, they are all pretty short. It's very difficult to find more than three or four oscillatory cycles in a row, and the frequency you see is extremely scattered and dispersed, all but a metronome. Going on, frequency is inconsistent. So, uh, you can present many times, this, this is a criticism by uh, Mumsel, uh, and uh, you can present the same stimulus many times, and every time you will get slightly different frequencies. And sometimes the frequency remains constant, as in a nice textbook, but sometimes it starts jumping down, jumping down and coming back, fluctuating pretty regularly in a way which is haphazardly related to the stimulus contrast uh, and properties. So once again, this type of oscillatory signal doesn't seem to have the property, even in evoked condition like here, to serve as a coordination mechanism. Uh, yeah, that's another paper where they show that furthermore, these fluctuations in frequency do not relate to the power. Sometimes you can have strong power and high frequency, sometimes strong power and low frequency. So it's not an easy thing. Okay, so many criticisms. And finally, maybe the last argument, which becomes very relevant when you consider now large scale, uh, beyond the simple cartoon uh, I had before. So uh, a region is receiving uh, oscillatory inputs from many different other brain regions, and these many other brain regions are located at very varied, very diverse distances from the receiver target. And uh, the propagation delay is therefore will be very different and then basically there is no actual way to easily synchronize and coordinate with many regions at the time, because every time the delay is slightly different. Okay, so this is another killer argument once again by Mamsel and Supertim Bry. Okay, so oscilloskeptics have good arguments. So what should we do? Should we uh, drop fully the crazy idea that oscillations have a role in coordinating brain signals and in implementing information routing? Well, actually, many of these experimental arguments, both from the oscillopartisan side and the oscilloskeptic side, in reality are based on a pretty naive idea, implicit idea, of how oscillations could really affect information processing. As a computational neuroscientist, as a theorist, uh, probably our duty 
should be to contribute to the debate uh, by showing really what oscillatory dynamics, and notably self-organized oscillatory dynamics, can really do beyond the naive observations of the modulation of excitability, uh, which is correct, but it's just the starting point, as you will see when you consider the, the role of oscillation with a more theory-oriented and theory-inspired view. Okay, so uh, actually our job as computational neuroscientists would be really to, to push forward, to extrapolate the original conceptual model, word model of Pascal Fries, into a proper computational and theoretical model to show actually how the dynamical properties of oscillation themselves can find solution to, to cope against the arguments raised by the oscilloskeptics, which are good arguments, okay? So let's go. So the key point is that oscillations are a collective phenomenon, okay? So uh, it's something that the system tends to do even when perturbed, because the system intrinsically organized to produce them. It's not like an electronic circuit where I buy an oscillator and I plug it, okay? And then if I break it, it stops working. In the brain, actually, there are no, re at the neural level, there are no things such as real oscillators. Neurons, uh, when driven tonically, uh, maybe can be oscillators, but in the brain, they are not driven tonically. As a matter of fact, we are in a pretty balanced state where the firing uh, of the neurons is irregular. And uh, what a, a long series of theoretical articles uh, by Sao Jin Wang, Nicola Brunel, and uh, David Ansel, and so on, has shown is that you can have a perfect coexistence between the irregular oscillatory dynamics and the perfectly weakly, uh, weakly regular neuronal activity. So actually, this dismantles the argument of uh, the weakness of correlation as an obstacle to the, to the function of oscillations into, into interrupting in information processing. So uh, actually, this comes from simulations, but it's pretty similar to what experimental study uh, at Columbia University has have also shown. You can have a perfect coexistence of large voltage correlations in the can indicate in the presence of a strong oscillatory dynamics here you see in the uh, cross correlograms of voltages the waves arising with a near absence of spiking correlation you see the spiking correlations are pretty weak and uh, the pairwise spiking cr cross correlogram don't exhibit the, the the traces of oscillation uh, that the intracellular recording uh, show uh, these cross correlograms and correlation analysis come from simulations of this, of this kind where the population oscillates regularly, that's a raster, but the single neurons fire, keeps firing in a Poisson way. So this, the weakness of correlation is not an obstacle. Uh, as a matter of fact, even the broadband nature of the spectra raised by Shapley is perfectly compatible with the strongly population level synchrony synchronous oscillation going on. As soon as the oscillation is not regular, but is uh, more chaotic-like, as uh, in many conditions neural circuit uh, uh, can reduce, actually this comes from a modeling study I did with David, David Nancel a lot nearly 10 years ago actually, uh, where we were showing that uh, if you have uh, multiple co-generating population uh, into a given location, the interaction between the rhythms generated by one population and the other co-generated population are going to destabilize the periodicity of the rhythm, creating a rhythm which is effectively chaotic when you drive the, the system strongly. So in this modeling study, we were therefore showing that when you drive the population at a weak drive, the activity will remain essentially asynchronous, hence this decay in spectrum, but when you drive it strongly, the interactions between multiple oscillation generators are going to, to create an oscillation which is still synchronous, but temporarily regular in such a way that the spectrum remains broadband. So even this broadband spectrum argument, it's not enough to rule out the presence of a strong oscillation. But let's move now to what is more interesting, the coordination between oscillations. So oscillations are a collective phenomenon and their coordination 
is a collective phenomenon as well. As a matter of fact, uh, I like to say that functional collectivity follows dynamics and dynamics is a collective self-organized dynamics, allowing self-organized control of functional connectivity even when things go wrong and the system is strongly perturbed or strongly noisy. Uh, for instance, moving now, I have shown you before that it's perfectly possible to generate popu oscillating populations, oscillatory population dynamics compatible with weak neuronal correlations and broadband gamma spectra. Now let's put together multiple couple populations, always from the modeling point of view, because we want to extrapolate an idea into a real computational model to show what self-organization can do. So actually what one can see is that uh, as soon as you start coupling together oscillatory population, they will be able actually to um, give rise spontaneously to a multiplicity of possible phase locking modes. Okay, a single hardwire circuit is going to generate phase locked modes uh, as a collective emergent phenomenon. And here I draw, I've drawn a landscape where I indicate the presence of multiple alternative phase locking modes, for instance, with different phase ordering of the different populations. Okay, so these uh, states emerge. I will come back to these actually to understand what are the conditions under which they can emerge and what are the factors determining the phase relations that can be possible. But these phase relations actually spontaneously emerge. We don't need some mechanism to align them. It's the spontaneous dynamics that tend to produce these phase locked states, allowing potentially a direct transfer of information. So actually in the model, it is possible to generate large quantities of simulated data inside each one of these different states and to show actually uh, what is the information routing profile that the system implement automatically when prepared in one of these states. I don't have the time to go much into the information theory functionals. Uh, yes, the students at the presentation. I just give a very really fast reminder. So uh, what we are going to do now is to uh, show how each one of these different phase locking modes that uh, uh, circuits with coupled or circuit population can generate will translate in an alternative way of exchanging information. So be because we want basically to create a computational demonstration of uh, the possibility of an oscillation to motivate information transfer quantitatively. So we need some way to measure information transfer between these couple of populations to see whether information is actually passing through these structural uh, connection, which are of, um, made by long range excitatory connection between populations. So to, we can quantify information transfer using an information theoretical functional called transfer entity. So, which is the information transfer that these states enable. Let's measure transfer entropy inside each of them. Digression, parenthesis. So let's suppose that uh, we quantify the amount of information that is present in the activity of a given neural population at a given time. So here, for instance, uh, we could quantify the amount of information that the spiking activity of a subset of neurons in population X convey now in terms of the Shannon entropy. Uh, we may wonder from where this information is coming. The possibility is that this information is now there, is there now, because it was there already in the past activity of the same site. This part of the information is what we will call the actively stored information. However, there may be some of this information may also be in common with the information that some other neural pool was conveying. Some of the information which is present in X now could be present as well in the past activity of another site. Now, if you want to define the amount of information that the given site Y have transferred to another site X, 
what we need to do is taking, take, taking this shared information, this information which is in common between y and x, and subtract from it the stored information, the information that x had already in the past. So actually, if we compute a an information theoretical functional that tells me the shared information which in x and y, which is not also shared with the past activity of x itself, this information theoretical functional called transfer entropy is going to measure an active transfer of information from, from one side to the other. Okay? Okay, let's now go back to these motifs I was showing and let's compute inside each one of the possible dynamical phase locked configuration that the system can generate. Let's compute inside of each one of these uh, possible dynamical modes that the given structure motif can generate the transfer entropy between the populations. What we will find is that each of these uh, direct phase locking patterns translate into a different way of exchanging information. For instance, uh, the, the state in which the green population precedes in phase the orange population will translate into a significant information transfer from the green to the orange population, but not the other way around. Or we may have other configurations where the transfer is uh, by bidirectional but anisotropic, uh, as captured here by these arrows that are present when there is a significant transfer entropy between the population in a given state and so on and so forth. And for n equal three, it's even more complicated. So you can see actually how indeed the self-organization of oscillatory dynamics of these motifs automatically will translate in, in multiplicity of possible way of exchanging information between the populations. Importantly, one may wonder actually what would happen if I started playing with the legs, the leg argument. You remember, according to Ray, Ray and Mansell, the fact that the leg of the propagation between two populations is unpredictable uh, may result in the possibility to exploit this type of uh, routing mechanism based on oscillatory locking. Well, as a matter of fact, it's not the case. Let's go back to this, the simple of this toy brain, this one with just two couple brain regions. What we can see is that these two brain regions can lock in a stable manner at whatever phase difference they want, but as a function of the strength of the effective inhibition that is present inside the population. So this diagram is analytic from the mean field version of the spike inversion network and also even for the spiking simulation. So as a matter of fact, here you see that independently from the delay of the long range connection that I put between the two couple population, for instance, let's suppose that we have a delay which is four times the typical synaptic propagation inside each of the population, I will be able to stabilize out of phase states, anti-phase states, out of phase states, in phase states, and so on and so forth, just by changing the effective strength of inhibition relative to excitation inside the population. So this means that in reality, the phase locking that the population have is not an artifact, a byproduct of, the, of how the regions are coupled, but is once again a self-organized emergent property of your system that is under the control of many dynamic factors. We may precisely think that by changing a population can actually enter properly, correct, repair the phase relation with the receiver with whom it wants to talk just by finally controlling the strength of inhibition inside it. Of course, there is no experimental confirmation for this, but that's an example of how interrogating word models, conceptual models produced by experimentalists like the communication to queers one with the tools of theory, one can easily uh, show how self-organization dynamics, which is the non-trivial part that probably an experimentalist without thinking in terms of dynamical system could not have found, one can easily be found that this self-organization can may contain the solution to the dysfunctioning pointed out by the oscilloskeptics. Okay, are you lost? Is it fine? Um. So at this stage, well, this is uh, sorry the animation of what I just told you. You see the possibility of stabilizing very different phase relation by 
a very tiny variation of the strength of inhibition inside the population. Uh, there are other special effects. I will go fast because I don't want to, um, I want to speak about uh, the next, uh, the second part also. But for instance, other non-trivial special effects that self-organized oscillatory dynamics may induce is the fact that non-local effects can arise out of local manipulation. As uh, Christoph, with, we have a straw with Christoph Kears and Mark Time in this uh, old study, for instance, by changing the drive to a node inside the community A, or by changing slightly a synaptic coupling inside community A, we can not only induce a change of the direction of the functional connections pointing to A, but also an inversion of uh, the connectivity between the two remote modules, modules B and C. So uh, self-organized behavior of phase locking may actually lead to the possibility of remotely controlled, remotely controlled functional connectivity mediated by oscillation at the level of an entire distributed network, well beyond the specific locations where my control mechanism are implemented and applied. Okay, so these we have uh, explored in these previous studies. Uh, another uh, study we, I want just briefly to mention is this one by Agostina Palmigiano, uh, that did in cooperation with Fred Wolf and Theo Geisel. You may remember the most pernicious of all the criticism of the oscilloskeptics, uh, which uh, uh, was the stochasticity of the oscillation. Now, all the models I have been showing you until now and oscillations which are pretty regular. What about I modify my model to give rise to transient and stochastic oscillations uh, as um, the one that are observed in vivo? You remember, this was the in vivo distribution of burst durations and frequency uh, of individual oscillatory bursts in the visual cortex. So Agostina has taken the spiky models uh, of the toy motifs with the multiplicity of phase locking patterns I was showing you a few slides ago, has uh, increased the heterogeneity of the input conductances to the various neurons and induces a substantial amount of heterogeneity in the synaptic parameters and has managed to create models at the edge of synchrony. So the edge of synchrony expression may be misleading because it into criticality or there is not a real criticality. So it's the same transition from a synchronous to synchronous behavior I was showing you before in a strongly synchronous network, but when you have heterogeneity and fine size of your network, fi fi with finite meaning up to 100,000 neurons, you may see that these transitions in reality is extremely broad. You have a very broad transition where the system transiently display in an alternative and stochastic way the properties of the asynchronous regime and of the synchronous regime. This gives rise, as a matter of fact, to transient oscillatory event, which statistics, which are semi-quantitatively matching the one of experimental data without need of any fine tuning for whatever network taken into this broad edge of synchrony. So now, if we take two networks at the edge of synchrony and we look at the spectrogram of their oscillatory activity, we will see that these spectrograms give rise indeed to stochastic and fleeting gamma activity, but this stochasticity is coordinated between the two sides. For instance, you see here that area X and area Y has much bars matching in time. And indeed, the probability of overlapping bars timing is much above chance level. At the time of publication, this was a prediction. Uh, meanwhile, Pascal Fries has confirmed experimentally this prediction. Let's go on beyond the overlapping burst timing. What about phase relations? If you compute phase relations between the two couple populations overall, essentially there is no locking. You see the global distribution of phase differences is essentially flat. But if you now zoom into these events of strong transient synchrony, you will find that the system keeps self-organizing into its many possible favorite phase relations during this transient burst in such a way that the phase locking behavior during the transient is, as a matter of fact, 
reflecting the same phase locking behavior I had shown you before with the possible multiplicity of possible phase locking relations, uh, uh, which are now just transient and not persistent. Let's add the next logical step. What about the information transfer? In the synchronous state, we have, we have been seeing that different phase locking modes give rise to different ways of propagating information. What about now these different transient phase locking modes? So actually, we can restrict precisely the same transfer entropy analysis to compute information transfer without bursts of either one of the different possible phase locking stable relations that can be transitly observed and actually discover that when I have a transient phase locking of a given time, I have indeed the announcement of transmission in one direction. When I have transient bursts of another type, I will have transient, tr transient announcement of transfer in the other direction. And that when I don't have bursts, information transfer fail going above the translator. Okay, so uh, actually, you see, we have now taken a system which is as stochastic in its behavior as what has been observed experimentally, but that in virtue of its self-organization properties, keeps self-organizing into a set of alternative possible phase locking states, even during its transients. And as a matter of fact, communication to coherence can selective communication to coherence and controllable communication to coherence keeps being implemented during this transient even when the system is irregular. So we have created a system working as the oscillopartisans say to do what the oscillopartisans say oscillations are doing. What was missing in the debate between the partisans and the skeptics was dynamics. Okay? Okay, so this stops the first part, which was already pretty long. Uh, um, and it introduced me to briefly to the second coda I would like to give to my talk, uh, which is uh, uh, about what could be some extra role of oscillatory dynamics beyond routing. So already now you have seen that when you take complexity in mind and then I'm in mind, you can show the functionality classic communication to his, to his picture, but you also modify it strongly. In the classic communication to coherence picture, you indeed have something like a lasting weak coherence uh, giving rise to a flow of information for sure, yes, but probably as weak as uh, and trivial and flat in time as the average coherence pattern would be. The reality we have that we have replaced, with which we have replaced this vision based on average coherence, is a much more dynamic one in which the system can, depending on the time, communicate in different ways, sometimes disconnect fully, and so on and so forth, in a way which looks pretty different from a regular metronome pace system, but which is pretty organic and irregular. Okay, so uh, this is probably this temporal network rather versus average network approaches may be more faithful to neural dynamics. But the question is, when we accept that dynamics is complex, could it be that this complexity is something more something beyond just an additional complication we have to keep in mind when thinking in a simple way. Could, be, could it be that this complexity is not just something against which to fight by the self-organization? Could it be that this complexity is precisely something that the system self-organizing do because this complexity could be computationally useful? Okay? So that's the extra step that I'm getting more and more interested in and that uh, I have been investigating in a, in, in a series of experimental studies, some published uh, and uh, some uh, still in preparation. 
this psychedelic transition is because now I am getting a bit weird. Prepare. <laughs> so this guy down below here, Alan Turing, uh, a while ago uh, set up the um, list of the minimum criteria that the system should display in order to be able to compute. So for a system in order to be able to compute, the system should display different way of process information depending on the state in which it is. And the transition between its possible states should depend on the information processing which has been made. So a Turing machine like this one built in Lego is a system displaying these two hallmarks. But the definition of computing system is way more general than the Turing machine itself. So if I take a system like this cellular automaton, which is the game of life, it is able of universal computation as a Turing machine, despite its much more organic look and feel. Okay, so we shouldn't immediately think that when I say that the brain is computing because of its dynamics, I'm thinking the brain works like a Turing machine. The way it's working as a computing system according to Turing, and the Turing machine is one of the possible implementation, but not the only one. So, what about these? That's complex dynamics at the macro scale, that's complex dynamics at the micro scale, where we will focus today. So, may it be that these complex dynamics, similar to the one of the game of life superficially, displays the hallmarks of computation. So, state dependent information processing, we have already seen through the previous models that it may well be the case. For instance, the sharing and transfer of information is different depending on the state. So, we may want to relax a bit this second hallmark into something more measurable at the current stage. We will content ourselves to detect the evidence that state transitions are not totally random, but structured in some manner. So can, could we chase for all marks of uh, uh, computation into the neural dynamics paced by ongoing neural oscillations? So I'm not saying that I am over with this new program. The routing program was my program for the last 10 years. That's maybe my one for the next 20 years. And that's just the beginning. So it's very speculative and it's just the beginning. So I just want to orient you toward what is the questions I have in mind. Let's go back to actual data. So actually I announce you. So the data I'm going to show you some analysis of are uh, re report, uh, multi recordings in uh, entorhinal cortex, hippocampus A1 and prefrontal cortex of uh, rats. During anesthesia and initial sleep, we also have the behavior, but it's not yet analyzed. So by the group of Christophe Bernard and Pascal Quigny. So the advantage of sleep and anesthesia is that you can have, uh, you can record several hundreds of single units and follow them in a relatively stable ways over hours in anesthesia and over tens of minutes in sleep. So another nice aspect of this recording is that you have a lot of spectral state transitions. You see clearly, for instance, in sleep, the alternation between non-REM and REM sleep, and the anesthesia, you have an even clearer picture with this alternation within slow wave epochs and the theta oscillation epochs. Okay, so we have a system which we can follow in a very parallel way for long times, and it has a multiplicity of oscillatory configurations, okay? So here is frequent, frequential spectral configuration more than locking configurations to start with, okay? But it's a system which has potentially some interesting dynamics, okay? So what about information processing by the system? So actually, uh, my PhD students, Wesley and Nicola, uh, have been analyzing raster plots of this type. You see, you can have uh, LFPs from something like 60 different uh, channels to different brain regions uh, and uh, single unit dynamics uh, uh, of several tens or hundreds of single units. And what they have been doing is actually computing time resolved feature of interest uh, about firing, about phase of firing, but also about information processing. Okay, so they've been uh, taking a sliding window, 
long enough to evaluate some information theoretical functional. So 20 seconds for anesthesia is enough to have some kind of quick and dirty information theory functional estimated, then you can refine a posteriori in a state-based manner your estimation. They have been computing features in a window, then sliding feature. Computing the feature in another window. What type of features? So they have been computing uh, 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 features such as spectra, the oscillatory dynamics ongoing in a given window, the firing of the different neurons, but also other more complicated features such as, uh, uh, yes, sorry, such as uh, uh, how much information a given neuron is storing at a given time, the active storage functional I have briefly presented before, and how much information a neuron is sharing with another neuron, the poor brother of transfer, which is easier to estimate in short windows, okay? So now for each one of the windows, we will have a profile telling us how much a neuron is storing information, how much a neuron is sharing information, and this is going to give us a sort of a computing fingerprint of the type of microscopic assembler level computation that the neural population we are measuring from is implementing in a given time window. So focusing on sharing, uh, given the short time, so at every time you compute a sharing network telling you which uh, how the different neurons in the system are exchanging information between them. And what Nicola, in cooperation with uh, Alain Barra, have uh, been finding is that uh, the time resolved information sharing networks fluctuate pretty continually, despite the discreteness of the global oscillatory states that my system display with this alternation between slow oscillation and theta oscillation. So, however, this movie which looks pretty random-like when you look at it in this way, when looked more in detail, displays some kind of interesting feature. Notably, uh, uh, computing what is called coreness, that tell me how integrated is a neuron with other neurons, or how peripheral is a neuron with respect to the rest of the network, we find that there are interesting oscillation of the coreness of specific neurons. Here, for instance, this violet neuron will be pretty integrated at a given time, peripheral at another time, then integrated again, and so on and so forth. And as a matter of fact, you see that this central core is not all the time the same, because it's spitting and absorbing different cells depending on the time, some of them remaining in the core all the time, and some others being organized, being uh, attracted at a specific moment. Another vision of the same picture is this uh, nonlinear two-dimensional projection of the network movie, showing clearly the existence of discrete network states that my system is jumping through in time. And another way of uh, uh, visualizing these is through these recurrence matrix, where we can actually compare the network structure at a given, in a given time window with the network structure observed in another time window. Here you see the this block here indicates that the network structure observed at a given time is similar to the network structure observed at, at these other times, but it's pretty different from the network structure that I had at these other times or at these other times in the future. So actually, this analysis highlights this mixture of random fluctuations and discrete light combinatorial organization of my network structure in this recording, in such a way that they can really extract some kind of computing state at the level of information sharing, and I could do the same for information storage, for instance. Now, let's go back to the relation with oscillations. What you see is that the collective oscillatory states are way more simpler, way more simple than what's happening at the level of the microscopic network dynamics. Here, I have a multiplicity of oscillatory states inside a coherent oscillatory epoch in slow oscillation. And the same happened here with theta. So there is something more happening at the level of the computation in the system, which go beyond what the global oscillatory configuration of my system are telling me. And it is also just poorly shaped and poorly paced by these ongoing global oscillations. OK? So we may wonder what is the relation 
of these more complex information processing dynamics with the collective oscillation, therefore. So I have shown you the existence of a multiplicity of discrete states of sharing. They could be of computing, more in general computing. So how do they distribute through the global oscillatory modes of my system? What we found is that most of the states of sharing, the substates, the, share, the computing substates, uh, states are specific to either one of the different oscillatory modes with a few exceptions. So if, if you consider each one of these computing states as a sort of internal code words in the programming language of the information processing, the known information processing that my system is implementing, we may want to say that the dictionary of this computing language is dependent on the oscillatory mode. What about the sequences? Because the states actually come in sequences. Are they sampled randomly or not? As a matter of fact, we find computing, compute chiting called Mogoro complexity, that the sequence of the states we observe are not random, neither regular. They have a complexity which is above an order version, but which is below a shuffle version. So they are between order and chaos. It means they are complex. And furthermore, the complexity of the specific syntax explaining their organization into sequences is different depending on the oscillatory state. I don't have the time to go into detail. We can maybe discuss in the question time. But actually, you can nicely see here that most files we have recorded to sleep, to anesthesia, and to different brain regions have complexities which are well below the chance level that will be somewhere around 0 0.9, actually. And that they are tend to be systematically higher during the theta epochs than during the slow oscillation epochs. So the oscillatory mode doesn't tell you how my system is computing because there is a multiplicity of states, but tell us what is the dictionary of words that they can use and what is the grammar I should use to create sentences out of these words. In other words, oh, yeah, we could also show actually that in epilepsy, everything gets more random, but I don't have time for this. So let me wrap up. These experimental studies, uh, therefore, tend to indicate that oscillation may have yet another role beyond binding or routing. But more in general, we're fully assuming that information processing has its own complexities that cannot be reduced to simple mechanism that they can follow with an intuitive vision of the role of oscillation. We may actually advance the hypothesis that what oscillations still are doing, despite all this complexity, is modulating the complexity of an arbitrary language of information processing. In the specific case of the sharing and storage substates in these studies, we have seen it. We will now to see how much this role of oscillation as setting a language for information processing, which is oscillatory state dependent, resists to more complex analysis in places of behavior and so on. But as I told you, that's the beginning of the program. And uh, I don't know yet the answer, but for sure, I have been convincing myself more and more that the brain not only is queer, but could probably even be queerer than how much our model can suppose. Thanks for your attention. And sorry for being, once again, slightly over time. Thank you very much. A very interesting seminar, uh, Damien. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there might be some questions. So uh, who wants to start? Can you uh, um, not share the screen, Damien, yeah. so we see you? Yeah, I see the sure. others. Yeah. Okay, who, is, who wants to start with the questions? I see some raised hands. Ingo. <laughs> First of all, I enjoyed your presentation very much, Damien. Thank you very much. Nice to see you here in a box. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to ask a question related to the first part when you talked about the information 
uh, routing and transfer. Yeah. You mentioned that the local inhibition was actually determining which uh, functional uh, connectivity you got and in which direction and routing uh, you achieved, right? Yeah, this but was what, one of the factors, yes. So, but what, what, what would what need to be happening is that something regulates beforehand this local inhibition, right? Yeah. What would be that? Yeah, very good question. So, uh, so in these specific models, uh, we could uh, analytically predict the role of oscillations, uh, uh, of inhibition in uh, setting up the locking because uh, we had uh, an explicit uh, expression for the phase response curve at the level of the population. So this phase response curve determines uh, uh, indirectly what are the stable lockings. Mm -hmm. So determines the dynamo, the repertoire of possible locking modes and therefore the repertoire of possible functional connectivities. So in this specific case, when you move the inhibition, you shift, you, you shrink a bit the PRC, so you shift a bit the zeros of the coupling function and you modify the phase lockings. So other parameters could do the same, EI balance, for instance, or local delay, I think. So um, as a matter of fact, when uh, the local delay is way faster than the long range delay, which could be all the case in uh, this uh, interregional uh, interaction, so you can have in a very narrow range of inhibition, a very wide variety of possible lockings. So you need, uh, uh, and since the way, and, and, and actually the change of inhibition is, is actually going to modify instantaneously the PRC. And since the PRC is what organizes the self-organized the, the self locking, the adjustment can be very fast because it's self-organized. You have the, the spontaneous forces that your system creates doing it. You don't need somebody creating a relocking like you would have for real capital yet. Okay, so now what, what could be doing this? In our discussion, we speculate that this could be inhibitory diversity. You have a variety of uh, interneurons and you have a very subtle mechanism for recruiting differentially different inhibitory subtypes. As a matter of fact, actually this fine control of inhibition may have an additional function of tuning the knob to the phase you want to listen to. Right. So that's a prediction we make, of course. We don't have proofs, but it casts a new fascinating, it casts, uh, it, it, it pro we propose a new fascinating role for inhibitory control by interneuron diversity. Mm -hmm. Because everything was self-organized, except that you had to have the local inhibition yeah, you're set totally right. at a certain level, right? Yeah, you're totally right. You may actually want uh, to add the uh, plasticity, maybe. Mm -hmm. You may actually have some kind of, well, there might be something external that tells you who you should listen to, but then you may want maybe to learn some kind of internal system that tells you, well, you should drive more these neurons or this other, this inhibitory population rather than the other, depending on the input you receive. Of course, you could think that you have some kind of self-organized learning added on top of the dynamics we have now, which didn't have plasticity. Thank you very much. Any other question? I have a short one, to Damien, because uh, you are assuming that you have some epochs of uh, in, in, in gamma band, for instance, that the, the system is synchronized for a quite short time. So, but the, how long would it take this synchronization to, to be reached? Because it is not instantaneous. We know it is not instantaneous. Systems are desynchronized and they have a very little time to be synchronized. How that yeah. happens? Yeah, actually, we, we measure these uh, also. I think it's one of the supplementary fields of the paper or something like this. But so actually, uh, that's the point. So I think the, that's the advantage of the edge of synchrony mm. on the synchrony regime. Mm -hmm. In the synchronous regime, you have an oscillator and you need indeed to align with another oscillator. Okay. Uh, you then, therefore, you may think that there is a time for realigning, uh, mm -hmm. even if in reality the system is uh, as very strong forces driven toward it. So it's not just. Uh, so, so it may be faster than you think, even in this case. But in the edge of synchrony, specifically, you are below the op bifurcation. So you are more in a regime of uh, spiraling around a limit cycle than in a regime of uh, spiraling uh, away and then back into a fixed point, then 
being on limit FICO already. Mm -hmm. So in reality, what happens is that you have alternative ways of leaving the, the fixed point in one way or in the other, but when you leave it, is a mode for your is a low dimensional mode for your entire system. So you realize actually that uh, the oscillatory bursts are born in synchrony. Mm -hmm. okay. They are not synchronizing. They are born in synchrony because that's a mode for the entire system, not for just one of the region interacting with the mode of the other region. It's a mode for the system. So uh, this was the phase locking distribution in general, which is flat, but when you zoom it into the asynchrony events as the peaks and the asynchrony events are short, they may actually last even just two cycles. Mm -hmm. And they're, despite this, they have the peaks because it's really this being born synchronized. So it's really, that's uh, we call in the paper, this bottom state and top state. So uh, uh, I think that uh, it's called uh, Pilo Womelsdorf as cited us and called these uh, events the routing atoms, something like this, mm -hmm. and it's been chasing. The idea is that the system develops something like resting state networks, in a sense, that are suitable for directed communication. And therefore, how to control these? Well, since these are intrinsic modes that are there all the time, if you want to increase slightly the flow in one direction rather than the other, you just have to bias slightly your probability to select more some of these modes rather than the other. You even don't need to fully stabilize the system. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Any other question? Hi, Claudio. I have a question for Daniel. Yes. Hi, yeah. Daniel. Uh, just uh, when you say in the beginning, you consider that the information is translated in, when it's spike in the sender and not in the receiver, depending on the suitability of the... Yeah, the, that's the, the idea of the singer. Exactly. Freeze. But uh, most of the time you have bursts that can give rise to gamma power. And then you're going to have like bursts that are overlapping in the system. So how could the... How could it be translated to this to this scenario? Because you mean burst at the level of cells. Exactly. Cellular bursting. Yeah. Exactly. Well, okay, that's an interesting point. So uh, when you the the, the 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 neurons we have in our model uh, are simply Van Buzaki or integrated M5 neurons, so they don't have this bursting. Uh, the the question is, well, maybe a burst may be strong enough to excite the target even in a depressed phase. Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, the question is, uh, would this be noise? Would this be an additional mechanism? I don't think that the majority of the cells are bursers. So uh, Sha Bob Shapley had the model uh, where they were explaining the broadband spectrum via uh, the existence of gamma bursts at the level of the cells. Uh, I don't think that you need these to explain the broadband nature of the spectrum. And uh, as a matter of fact, I'm not really convinced that the bursters, the bursting cells are the majority of the pyramidons that can really project at wrong range. Quite on the contrary, in reality. I don't think that there are really so many bursting pyramids that can make cortical cortical connections. So uh, in our case, we can explain the broadband spectrum, well, either via a strong synchrony, but chaotic, the 2011 work with Ansel, or in this specific edge of synchrony case, by the fact that most of the time your system is asynchronous. So the spectrogram, the average spectrogram is broadband. So I don't think you need the bursters to explain the compatibility with the gamma bursting. The gamma bursting is emergent but the firing remains Poisson. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Any other question? None on the second part. Is it uh, totally it was, crazy? Was totally new for us. <laughs> no, it's, it, I mean, it was very interesting, but I need to see it again. I need yeah, to one, see it again. Well, two <laughs> papers are published. The third one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, will, I will go through it. Yeah, yeah. It was very interesting, but very novel for me, at least. Yeah, yeah, it's probably too much, too novel. We have to yeah. understand how to make it understandable. But it's cool. yeah. No, but it was very interesting. Anybody else to make a question? 
Well, if not, let's uh, thank uh, Damien for, the, for here, this complicated situation in a, in a, in a, in a talk which is never easy. I'm, but, I'm but in my bedroom, so it, it's eh? easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much and uh, an applause for you. Thanks. And, I see uh, many icons with applause. We, so. we, hope to see you, <laughs> we hope to see you soon in Palma, so next time uh, you can come and, and talk to the